The extensive wars which characterised the reign of Louis the Fourteenth proved to be a hardship only to the common man. To the bloodsuckers who hovered close to the crown, ready to profit from every disaster, they were no less than a blessing. Ah, the parasites! How they drained France dry, lapping up the last drop of blood which fell from the nation's battered flesh. Yes, then gnawing and nibbling at the skin and bones, in case there hovered within a drop or two more which had escaped notice. The jackals! The knaves! But the joyride couldn't last forever. Eventually there came the day of reckoning, and the villains were brought to justice. Well, not quite all the villains. Four, who had had the foresight to escape before justice's final trumpet sounded, went free as a bird. And these four, being well along in years, and now having more money than they could possibly spend in ten lifetimes, resolved to abandon all commercial pursuits and to band together to seek the ultimate excesses of libertinage and sensuality. The leader of the group was the Duke of Blanges, a monstrous scoundrel who, at age 50, had indulged at least once in every vice and every crime known to man. Ah, what a libertine! He was a drunk, a liar, a thief, a sodomite, a gourmand, and a motherfucker. Having qualified in this last category, at age 16, when he raped his mother on the way home from his father's funeral. Moreover, he was a devotee of arson, theft, calumny, blasphemy, and murder. Indeed, not only did he never so much dream of a virtue, he actually regarded the whole loss of them with horror, much as the virtuous are prone to regard vice, and no doubt for the same reason, lack of exposure. Physically, Blanges was as splendid as morally he was corrupt. He stood exactly six feet tall and weighed 180 pounds. His arms and legs were of enormous strength, his shoulders broad and powerful, his chest heavy and wide, his waist slim, his buttocks meaty. His face was proud and masculine, with great dark eyes, handsome black eyelashes, a straight stately nose, strong porcelain white teeth, and a rugged well-formed jaw. These many splendours, however, paled in comparison with his crowning glory, his enormous prick. Ah, what a shaft that was! What a monument! It measured an exact eight inches in circumference and a full fourteen in length, and when in an erect state, which was more often than not, shot out like a flagpole, not curving one way or the other, but extending straight forward, majestic and true. Oh, what a prick! And it enjoyed in functionability the same excellence which characterised its dimensions. The Duke could ejaculate as many as eighteen times a day without being any more fatigued after the last than after the first ejaculation. Moreover, his splendid ass, when he saw fit to put it to buggery's purposes, which was frequently, could receive as many as fifty-five pricks a day without being any the worse for wear. This, I say, was the Duke of Blanges, and if a blacker heart ever beat, it had to be the heart of Satan himself. Indeed, the Duke's chief complaint was, and how much more diabolic can one get, that far too many people misbehaved with impure motives, which is to say, they misbehaved not for evil's sake, but simply because of the pleasures attached to certain modes of misbehaviour. This motivation, in his view, was deplorable. It is simple enough, he was wont to observe, to do this or that when passion spurs one to the task, but the life of such a person must indeed be tortuous, for, since his indulgence was brought about by weakness, how can he fail to regret in the morning that which he enjoyed the evening before? He, on the other hand, who pursues evil for evil's own sake, indulges not from weakness, but from strength. Thus, each morning he does not bemoan his excesses of the night before, but rather congratulates himself for having perpetrated them. It is in this direction, surely, that happiness lies. Sharing this philosophy with the Duke, although lacking the physical equipment with which to practice fully what he preached, was the Duke's brother, the Bishop of X. He had the same black soul of Blanges, the same penchant for crime, and the same content for religion. Yes, and a slyness, a natural cunning which, if anything, outshone that of his brother. But he was an ugly little wart of a man. The bishop was, in years forty-five, in appearance disgusting. His features were delicate and slightly effeminate, 
his mouth foul-looking, his teeth rotting and misshapen, his eyes small and beady, his body soft, flabby and hairless, and lo, his member, an insult to the species, no more than five inches in circumference, no more than six in length. Perhaps the only redeeming feature about the man was his ass, which, though small, had the virtue of being well-rounded and firm to the touch. As for sexual preference, His Excellency was a devout sodomite, enjoying equally both the active and passive roles. However, his passion for asses was all-consuming. Unlike the Duke, who could give vent to his energies in any orifice offered him, the Bishop confined himself to asses and nothing but asses. Of cunts, he had an abhorrence that bordered on the maniacal. Not only could he never fuck one, but if, while fucking a female ass, he happened to recall that there was a cunt on the other side, the recollection all but ruined his pleasure completely. These faults notwithstanding, the bishop possessed an immense fortune. Moreover, through the many priests among whom he was influential, he was able to recruit numerous girls for exercises in debauchery, learning from his priests which girls had, during confession, admitted to licentious behaviour, and thus he was the first person invited by the duke to become a member of the group. The second person invited was Judge Caval, a pillar of society. He was 60 years of age, tall, thin, dry-skinned, blue-eyed, white-haired, and all but worn off his legs by a life of unmitigated depravity. Unwholesome of mouth and long of nose, the judge resembled nothing more than a sun-dried string bean. His back was hunched, his shoulders stooped, his buttocks were so deadened and desensitised by whip-strokes that you could squeeze a handful of flesh without his knowing that you did it. In the centre of these sagging, leathery cheeks, you didn't even have to spread them to see it, was an immense orifice whose unholy diameter, colour and odour brought to mind the asshole of a mare. Moreover, the slovenly judge always left this part of himself in such a state of uncleanliness that it was forever encrusted with a layer of shit at least half an inch thick. On the side of the body opposite this monument to filth hung a prick which, when erect, might have measured eight inches in length and seven in circumference. However, the erectile state of late had become, for Caval, increasingly difficult to attain, with the result that he no longer ever tried to participate in a sexual act wherein erection was necessary, unless he had first made arrangements for the many whippings, beatings, bloodlettings and so forth which he knew would be necessary to raise him to the task. As for preferences, he liked men. All the same, he was not wont to reject girls, especially if their cunts and asses gave forth with odours which approximated in strength his own stench. He had a special passion for eating shit, and took advantage of every opportunity to do so, regardless of the source. This act, perhaps more effectively than any other, aroused his passions to boiling point, and often spurred him to ejaculate, even if his prick did not happen to be erect at the time. Significantly, while ejaculating, he experienced a sort of lubricious rage, which drove him to perform unspeakable acts of cruelty. However, it might be noted that his cruelty was not confined to those times when the jismy juices flowed. Indeed, he acquired his fortune by murdering people, then seizing their lands, and often committed murders even when there was no profit to be gained thereby. The final member of the group was a banker, Dursit. Aged 43 years, a great friend of Blanges and his one-time schoolmate. Short, squat and chubby, this depraved financier had both the face and figure of a woman, and all a woman's tastes. In short, he was a total nance. His prick was unbelievably small, no more than two inches around and less than four inches long. But the deficiency was of no concern to him, since he has no desire to employ the member for functions other than excretory. On the other hand, his ass was so often engaged in sexual pursuits that he barely had opportunity to shit. He also was rather fond of oral pleasure, since this enterprise was the only one in which he was capable of playing the aggressive role. Like his three friends, Dursit worshipped only at the altar of the gods of pleasure. He had committed a profusion of crimes, murder among them, and was accused of having poisoned both his mother and his wife, crimes which he not only refused to deny, but about which he actually boasted. 
Now, once the group was organised, the four libertines created a common fund. Next, they purchased a house on the outskirts of Paris and engaged eight procurers of established reputation, four to recruit girls and four to recruit boys. They then set up a schedule of orgies designed to pamper the tastes, no matter how diverse, of every member of the organisation. Four different feats were conducted each week under the format which follows. The first evening, called the Eve of Masculinity, was devoted to sodomy and only men were present. Procurers would bring to the castle a complement of 16 healthy young studs, aged 20 to 30, and selected on the basis of prick size. Then our four heroes, dressed in feminine clothing, would swoop down upon them. Cocks would be sucked, bitten, blown upon, clutched, kneaded, stroked, petted and kissed. They would be taken up asses, squeezed between thighs, imprisoned in armpits and knee pits. Songs would be sung in their praise, poems recited, orations delivered. Then, so that our foursome would have ample opportunity to play the male as well as the female role, the procurers would bring on a second complement of 16 boys, much younger and predisposed to fulfil the offices of women. The lads, aged 12 to 18, were selected on the basis of delicacy of face and body, appearance of innocence, freshness of wit and keenness of intellect. There would be embuggerings and rapes, ass-fuckings and mouth-fuckings, and fuckings between the thighs and behind the balls. Before the evening had come to a close, there would have transpired every delight ever known in Sodom and Gomorrah, and a great many other delights of which no one in either of those esteemed cities had ever dreamed. The second evening, given over entirely to girls, was called the Eve of Humiliation. The procurers would bring to the castle twelve young ladies of superior social station, hoity bitches one and all. Our champions then would proceed to teach the lasses some manners. The girls were forced to submit to everything. Fingering, kneading, tweaking, pinching, biting, punching, kicking, ear-pulling, the banging of heads against the wall or against other heads, tit-pulling, encunting, embuggering, in short, any extravagance the perpetration of which was not prohibited by reason of anatomy or physiology. The third evening, the Eve of Blackness, also was given over entirely to girls, but to those of a different stripe. Only whores were present, and in company with them, our libertines wallowed in total debauchery. Shit was eaten, piss drunk, saliva exchanged, fart smelled, vomit swallowed, there were multiple liaisons, and violence abounded. Of 100 whores in attendance at the beginning of each week's festivities, rarely, if ever, did more than 50 or 60 live through the night. There were fustigations, grandings, turnings at the wheel, stabbings, shootings, burnings, whippings, crucifixions, the full spectrum of cruelties. The fourth evening, given over to mixed company, was called the Eve of Defloration. Assembled were only youngsters whose virginity could be certified. Maidenheads were stolen, cherries busted, pucilages depucilated. When our heroes no longer had the strength to do the deed by prick, they employed candlesticks, dildos and other devices. No one left with an orifice uninvaded in some way or another. Thus were spent four per week of our libertines' evenings, and the other three were passed in private debauch. However, after several months, Blanchus decided that a change was in order. Summoning his colleagues to a meeting, he addressed them as follows. Gentlemen, our excesses to date have been gratifying, but if we would think of ourselves as true scoundrels, we must go much farther in our quest for pleasure. We must go, indeed, to such extremes the very thought of which should strike terror into the hearts of ordinary mortal men. Bravo! cried his audience of three. Capital! Superb! But, added Judge Caval after a moment, what would you suggest we do? What is there, after all, which we have not already done? I don't know, conceded the Duke. I can think of no specific desire which we have failed to satisfy, no specific thirst which we have failed to slake. 
Yet, I cannot help but feel that, if we were to isolate ourselves under circumstances most conducive to lewdness, if we were to extend our every effort to the expansion of lubricity's horizons, if we were to do such, I say, then I have no doubt that we would acquire these new thirsts, recognise these new desires. What I propose, therefore, gentlemen, is the establishment of a school of libertinage. Envision this. A castle high in the Alps, inaccessible save by foot, gathered therein a complement of the most provocative creatures one can find, splendid specimens of sexuality, whose very presence is sufficient to stir the blood of the most jaded rake. Eight little girls, with virginal cunts to be fucked, virginal asses to be reamed, virginal tits to be kneaded and mashed and beat to a pulp. Also, eight little boys, equally virginal, ready to lend themselves to every lubricity which the voluptuous mind can conceive. Next, eight fuckers, monsters one and all, with throbbing pricks to probe one's bowels and rock-hard buttocks to receive their master's fuck in return. Then, four madames, yea, the foremost experienced madames in Paris, to advise the company on this passion or that. After all, who would be in a better position to offer advice on the ways of libertinage than those whose lives have been devoted to trafficking in it? Next, four wives, one for each of us, to satisfy wants not satisfiable elsewhere. Then four old hags, to serve as chaperones for the kiddies, and also to lend themselves to the more perverse varieties of debauch with which from time to time we may choose to amuse ourselves. And finally, a smattering of lackeys and servants to keep the ship afloat. Envision yourselves, I say, locked up in a castle with a coterie like that, devoting not just an occasional evening to debauch, but, gad, what a prospect, every waking hour. Add to the picture a full schedule of meals fit for the king himself, add wines of every vintage, liqueurs imported from every corner of the globe, by God's gronch, who could ask for anything more? Ah, fuck, cried the bishop. What an inventive mind this brother of mine has. I dare say I could think of nothing to improve the picture. You have my vote, sir. Yes, and mine, added Caval. Moreover, I own the very castle you describe. It's located in Silling, in the Black Forest, far out of the reach of meddlesome authorities, surrounded on four sides by cliffs one thousand feet high, protected by walls and moats, completely safe and completely comfortable. We need only take possession of it, gentlemen, and it's ours to do with as we wish. Splendid, said Dursit. As to the voting, I shall make it unanimous. I am ready to go whenever the rest of you are. But, Duke, may I be permitted a question? You speak of our bringing wives. Don't you think there'd be something of a bother? Ah, my fine Nance, smiled Blanges. Never having had a taste for women, you fail to realise their many uses. Hold, Duke, interrupted Caval. Hold, I say. There's a fence in your speech. Dursit may be a Nance, but I'm sure that he's as much a libertine as the rest of us. Wager some money on it, and I'm sure that he can match any one of us depravity for depravity. Patience, you jaded jurist, replied Blanges. I don't question the man's libertinage, but neither of you understands my views on marriage. Do you think I want a wife so as to have a legal mistress? By God's cock! I want her, you withered old cunt. I want her for the purpose of serving my whims, for the purpose of veiling an infinite number of secret debauches, which can be concealed only by the cloak of marriage. Ah, oh, great fucking John! We libertines don't marry for morality, Caval. We marry to hold slaves. We marry because women, as wives, are rendered more submissive than mistresses. Bravo, Duke, shouted Dursit, applauding. I withdraw my question, and I am sure that the good judge, Caval, withdraws his objection. Your having explained it thusly now makes the whole matter crystal clear to me. I contributed the bishop. But there is another question which occurs to me, brother. Since I am unmarried and since you three are widowed, from where will the wives come? The Duke smiled mischievously. 
about to reveal the best prize which had been saved for last. We shall marry each other's daughters, gentlemen, he grinned. We shall bring them with us to Silling Castle, and there, in a specially constructed chapel, you, my dear ecclesiastic brother, may perform the ceremonies. A reverent hush fell over the room. All looked at the Duke with undisguised admiration. There was muted, respectful applause. Then, after a minute had passed, Gaval spoke as follows. Duke, I intend no further disrespect, and I should like to preface my remarks with the statement that your plan, as outlined this afternoon, leaves me awestruck. However, will you permit me another question? I know that you have a daughter, a lovely girl named Julie, if my memory serves me correctly. I have a daughter, Adelaide. But what of our gay friend, Dursit? And what of your holy brother? Whence come their progency? Sir, said Dursit, much as it may surprise you, it so happens that during my younger days I planted a seed here and there. Not that I ever liked women. I'm a full-blown queer and proud of it. But one experiments in youth, and the result of my experiments was my beautiful daughter, Constance. And I, added the bishop, have a daughter, Aileen. It's not that I have ever been any less hateful of cunts. No, I'm an ass man through and through, and I've always been. But, while a young seminarian, wishing to offend the ass-fucking almighty in heaven in as many ways as possible, I undertook the combination of incest, fornication, adultery, and sacrilege in a single act by placing a consecrated host on the tip of my prick and fucking my married sister. Aileen is the product of that quadruply sinful union. Well then, gentlemen, said the Duke, restoring order to the proceedings. Are we agreed that we shall marry each other's daughters? Agreed, cried the chorus, and the meeting came to a close.